be. So I think don't underestimate, you know, your, what you bring to the table, because if you are a good candidate, even if you're not a perfect fit for a certain position, those who see your value will, may find a way to, to have you, or they'll keep your resume on file and call you up when something does come available. And the other piece is don't underestimate the power of relationships. Welcome to episode 20 of the Food Grads Podcast, the podcast where we explore careers in the food, beverage, and hospitality industries. I'm your host, Veronica Hislip, a molecular science graduate student and career partner with Food Grads. On this week's podcast, I interview Danielle Collins, Economic Development Policy Analyst at the Ontario Federation of Agriculture. The Ontario Federation of Agriculture, or OFA, is a farmer-led dynamic provincial lobby which works to represent the interests of its farm members to the government. Their mission is to work collaboratively towards a profitable, sustainable future for Ontario farmers. In this episode, I learned about Danielle's career journey. She interestingly went to the University of Guelph for neuroscience, but after graduating and working in the hospitality industry, she realized that this path really wasn't for her and instead pivoted into a career of economic development. Danielle better explain to me what exactly is a policy and understanding where her role plays in the overall building of communities, as well how OFA is helping Canadian farmers. It was really fascinating because honestly, before this episode, I really didn't know much about what policies were, so stay tuned for that. Overall, the message of this episode was that the agri-food industry needs people from every background. Danielle dispels a lot of myths in this episode, such as agri-food jobs are only in the middle of nowhere, and she drops a lot of good advice that anyone can apply to themselves at any stage of their careers. So let's jump into it, onto the show. Thank you, Danielle, for coming on the show. I'm excited to have you on the show because I know that Food Grads has been partnering with the initiative from the Ontario Federation of Agriculture with their Feeding Your Future campaign right now. So it's great to have someone who's who's on this other side that can tell us about this great program and, of course, tell them about you yourself. So thanks for coming on the show. Yeah, it's great to be here. Thanks so much for the opportunity. We were talking before the show, and I heard about that you had a very interesting career path going from neuroscience to seemingly being in the agricultural industry with, to be honest, a job that I have literally no idea with what you do. So I think it'd be great to first get to know what you do, and then let's do a career cycle to find out how you got there. Sure, yeah. So to explain a little bit about the Ontario Federation of Agriculture, which we call OFA, we're a general farm organization, which means that we cover all farm types, all farm sizes, and farmers are our members. So we have 38,000 farm families across the province that are members of ours, and we represent their interests and advocate on their behalf, and also provide member benefits and different programming to support agriculture and, and the food industry. And my role as a policy analyst with a focus on economic development is to really look at growing the agri-food sector. So how can we make farmers more profitable, more successful, make sure that we have a strong, viable farming industry, and also how that extends to the broader agri-food sector from field to fork. So from my career journey, I guess, it's a very uh, zigzagged path. So Uh, In high school, I was actually very interested in uh, drama and musical theater. So I went to an arts high school. And then from there, I was really interested in science. So I did a neuroscience undergrad where I was doing lab experiments and all kinds of unique things in the science space and took a few years off and and was in tourism and uh, culinary tourism. I grew up in Niagara Falls so um, and, and Niagara on the Lake. And so spent a lot of time working in that sector and really that's where my passion for local food uh, grew and then uh, returned to school to do a master's in economic development. I was really interested in in business and thought I wanted to get into something related to environment and sustainability and then uh, kind of honestly just found this very unique way to apply my interest in agriculture and local food and merge it with my education and economic development. So I actually applied for the job, a different job at OFA 
and they actually created this position for me. So that's another uh, wow. story, <laughs> but it's been great to have that opportunity to craft my own position. I've been there five years now and it's been a really unique opportunity. Wow. That is a very interesting path. I mean, to go from, again, I don't even know how you discovered that there was a program for economic development, because honestly, I've never heard of it. So I just wanted to understand a little bit more. How does that differ from something like just a standard business degree? Yeah, great question. So again, because I was kind of coming at it from the environmental lens, I ended up looking into the University of Waterloo, which had a great school of environment. And, and interestingly enough, economic development fell under that school of environment because it's more about the built environment and you know, a community environment than it is about, you know, conservation and the typical things you would think of with environments. So while it does have business components, marketing and communications, traditionally people in economic development actually work for a municipality and their role is to help businesses grow, help them be successful. So whether that's through funding programs or mentorship programs, business incentives to help them diversify what they're doing, get online, things like that. And so while people hear economic development think economics, it really is more about community building and also supporting kind of the businesses to make sure that, yes, you need jobs and you need a tax base, but also there's so much more to it to make sure it's, you know, a place people want to live and work and that type of thing. So how do you merge that with agriculture? Well, agriculture is, of course, one of the sectors in a community that needs to be strong and successful. So it's a, a neat way to merge those two interests. That's so cool. And I, and it's really cool that there's like a strong program that you were able to go to that is in with Ontario, because I know from personal experience driving through Niagara, beautiful area for um, agriculture, but the whole green belt in Ontario in general, like there's so many different types of farms. It's not just limited to fruit farms. You have I believe there's a everything. There's just so many things. So yeah, 200 commodities. <laughs> so yeah, okay. Ontario is very diverse. Wow. It's, I live here, so I'm not surprised whatsoever. So I find it interesting that you had mentioned that you are working with different, like the job is really working with communities and really building up them from the other standpoint, of course, the business, but also making it a place that you want to have a job that's sustainable in, in your life that you can just keep on going with it. And I think that this would be a really good place to start talking about the Feeding Your Future campaign. And I would love for you to share more about what that is. Sure. Yeah. So Feeding Your Future, we initiated it May of 2020. And while it was a response to the pandemic and COVID-19, really there's been a challenge with workforce development and making sure that we have new new people coming into the sector and we're able to fill labor gaps and uh, make sure that our sector has uh, the workforce it needs to be successful. So COVID-19 did make that even more intense because we do have a large seasonal agricultural worker program and there were some delays and concerns about getting enough workers. So it was even more intense in the spring of last year that we really saw a need to, to fill that gap. And so we launched the Feeding Your Future project. We were successful in obtaining Canadian Agricultural Partnership funding, which is a provincial and federal government program that provides financial support to address labor and training challenges in the agri-food sector. And so we really wanted to come at it from a multi-pronged approach. So we thought it's not just about this filling immediate need of, of employers and job seekers, but it's also about the broader, how do we get more people aware of what, what types of jobs and careers are in, in agriculture? How do we get people excited about the opportunities? And really that kind of campaign to get more people hearing about us and connecting to more people than just within our typical agriculture network. So we had, uh, in the last year, we've run virtual career fairs, webinars. Uh, we had a job matching concierge service through agcareers.com and careersandfood.com where we were helping employers get online. So a lot of farmers tend to use word of mouth. So trying to get them to use online platforms and then also helping them find the correct, uh, you know, helpful candidates and vice versa, helping job seekers find those jobs. And 
also a large training component, which I'm sure we can talk in a, about in a bit more detail, but there's a few training initiatives that we've been working on diligently over the last year. And we also just found out we were successful in obtaining funding for another year. So we're very Ooh. excited <laughs> to, very uh, good. It's great timing for this podcast that we'll be launching more virtual career fairs and webinars and initiatives over the next year. That's very exciting. It's something can't be beat with going in person for a career fair. I am very happy to hear that with COVID, a lot of virtual things, it's really allowing more reach for people to actually have these one-on-one -on -one conversations without that. Because coming into a job fair, one of the nice things is you might not really know what you want. So you're just kind of looking around and all that, but it can be really intimidating. But being at home, you can bridge that gap without just reaching out to someone that you don't really know. So that is very cool. Exactly. And you know, if you are living in a community not close by to where a job career fair is, you might not be sure you want to take the time to, to drive out and commit mm -hmm. the day to it. But if you can just sign in online, free to sign up and kind of poke around, have a either a text chat or a video chat with someone working in the field in a very low pressure environment or even just perusing the job descriptions and, and what's available. Uh, I think a lot of people were, were surprised to see that it's, and I'm sure we'll get to this later, but it's not simply, you know, farm labor jobs. There are so many other careers in agriculture, in HR, in science, in technology, communications and marketing, sales. So we really do need all backgrounds at the table. And so to be able to showcase that and to be able to showcase what types of jobs are available that you can work in candy manufacturing, or you could work, you know, at a tractor dealership or, you know, actually going out and working with farmers one-on-one. -on -one. There's so many different types of careers, depending on your skill sets and your interests. And so we hope with those, it's also giving people a low pressure glimpse into what's available. So let's actually talk about that more right now, because I'm curious about the program. So I keep saying the word students, but that's very much a broad range of people from high school students to first year university students to maybe even graduate students. What kind of jobs are there out there for someone who's, let's just say, coming out of high school? Are there jobs that are available for them that maybe they don't need to get a college degree or let's talk about some spectrum? <laughs> Yeah, for sure. And that's another great thing about the entire agri-food sector is, again, we need everyone. We need people with high school, college, university, skilled trades. And so really any educational background has, there's a spot for you. And so that's, I think, another great uh, example. There's also a lot of opportunity for learning on the job and moving up within a, within a company or farm just by doing. And so that's another great way that we've seen if someone does come straight out of high school and get a job, yeah, they might have to start, you know, in an entry level position. But what we're hearing from agri-food businesses is it's really about work ethic and willingness to learn. And a lot of, you know, the skills and technical expertise, it has to be taught anyway and hands-on is how they'd rather do it. Okay. So in a lot of instances, you know, we're hearing about people that can move up quite significantly in a company just from getting that hands-on experience and being, you know, a solid employee that's willing to invest the time and effort into learning. And there's a lot of also shorter kind of courses. There's one for management, agri-management. Agri so it's a smaller kind of program where if you've gone as far as you can go in your position, you want to get some management experience, you know, you can go take a short diploma type thing, certificate in order to do so. You don't have to have a four-year undergraduate degree and that kind of thing. So it's nice to have options that way that you can continue mm -hmm. to learn while working or um, can kind of return to school once you figure out what type of training you want to beef up your resume with. But because you're saying that a lot of these jobs are, a lot of the employers are more than happy to teach you the skills more specifically for that job. But how do you get your foot in your do the door when you don't, you might not be able to show the passion that you know exactly what you want to do? Like I said, I think that there's really, they're looking for the right fit kind of from a culture perspective, from a work ethic perspective. One of the things that we're doing through Feeding Your Future is offering a 
certificate. So it's an online certificate. It's only eight to 10 hours to complete e-modules. So you can go at your own pace to complete them. And it covers kind of an Ag 101, if you will. It's called the Ontario Agriculture Worker Safety and Awareness Certificate. But really the goals with it are to provide exposure to what types of uh, jobs and tasks occur on a farm, but also give you a bit of safety training and better understand what a day looks like. And so we're encouraging those who are even just in the job seeking phase to consider taking a certificate of that nature. It's fairly low, you know, time spent, but it, it shows, I think, to employers that you're interested in taking that opportunity and you're willing to work for it because going that extra step will help further ahead. And, and we're offering it for only $49 right now until the end of June with estimated value of $299. So it's a really great kind of discounted rate right now to try to get more people to take the course and get that experience. For sure. It sounds like it. And it would also be a really good way to dip your toe into knowing what expectations could be to see if this maybe could even be a good fit for you. Yeah. And we have a, we have a section on farm equipment. We have one on livestock, one on crops. So recognizing that there's different types of farms out there and there's different expectations on each one. So giving you just kind of a snapshot into the different opportunities out there. One of the things that also comes to mind as a young person as well is I think many students, I know that there's definitely, it's not the whole case, but a lot of students are expecting to be in like suburban areas and all that. And I know with farms, first thing that comes to mind is just a farm in the middle of nowhere. And you got to I'm just thinking about housing and all those types of things, because that is a big issue for that. And is this really the case that it, all the agricultural jobs are out in the middle of nowhere? <laughs> That's a great question. <laughs> and, you know, working on farms, it, there's a broad range. Some farms are just right on the urban fringe and others are maybe a little further out. Uh, some people would see that as a benefit, you know, to get yes. out of the city and yep. go yep. work out in fresh air in a, in a field. But as I said, that's, that's really one career out of many paths that you could take with agriculture and food. So some people have desk jobs, some people have sales jobs, so they're driving all over. It all depends on uh, in a laboratory, in a food processing facility. So really the work environment can be very different depending on what you're interested in. But in relation to transportation, I think I agree. It is, it is a challenge that we face for especially, you know, younger people who don't necessarily have access to a vehicle yet. And that's actually where sometimes when we're working with municipalities and communities, you know, to come up with those affordable transportation options, working on getting public transit out into rural communities. And sometimes even the employer themselves are, are able to arrange um, unique solutions in that way. So if you're close to an urban center, there could be some kind of ride sharing or, or carpooling that goes on to try to bridge that gap. But I, I wouldn't, it's hard to say that um, right. it isn't a challenge because there, there are issues with that, of course, but there are a lot of people working hard to make it as easy as possible. If people do want to work, you know, in a rural community and uh, that they're able to, to get to the job. I think that's a really interesting point you bring up. I don't remember who I was talking to, but I know that there's been some companies that actually have, like you said, got the city to put bossing routes specifically to take them to and from their facility. And maybe it might be even worth just mentioning to the employer, just, you know, make that a concern because sometimes just having someone say that they want to be involved in your company, they could work it out because they want to employ you as maybe you want to be employed there as well. Exactly. Yeah. And it's, it's something that we work on at OFA more broadly. So I'm on, I'm one policy analyst, but there's eight of us on the team and we advocate to provincial and federal governments about the needs and challenges with the sector at large. So while some might see, you know, just the agriculture component, of course, there's, you know, transportation, there's reliable broadband internet, there's childcare, there's, uh, you know, rural schools, making sure that if people want to have a family in, in a community and want to move there to work in agriculture, that there's a place for their families to go to school and for their spouses to have a job. And mm -hmm. so it yeah, goes on and on that there's a lot, a much bigger picture than just kind of, uh, 
the agriculture sector itself that, uh, you know, having, having rural communities that are, that have access to all these services and amenities that help the sector be successful. That's really interesting. And I know that as well, that it's, I know we've been talking about farms that for people who are listening, they may think, oh, we're just talking about rural farms, but there is a lot of opportunities in food processing sectors too, not just, you know, the food processing um, complement side to the agriculture that are closer to suburban areas for sure. And I know Mississauga, Vaughan, all these regions have a lot of food facilities. Oh, definitely. Yeah. And that's why I don't think you should ever limit yourself by geography because, you know, there's 860,000 people employed in the agri-food sector from field to fork mm -hmm. in Ontario. So it touches every, every community in some way, whether that's, as you said, in, in, you know, food processing and food service in you know, warehousing and logistics, it goes on and on. So there's so many other ways to connect if farm, the farm sector isn't exactly where you want to be and of course you know we haven't even talked about indoor agriculture and vertical farming and greenhouses and hydroponics and all kinds of places where you know the field isn't as important and really there are opportunities to grow food and grow agricultural products not in a in a farmer's field i'll be honest i forgot about that because I feel as though those types of places have just kind of crept in the background in the past few years and they're really starting to, no pun intended, grow. <laughs> and I, I don't, they're opening up and it's something I have a career I wouldn't have even thought about five years ago. And now it's, it's a very viable career path. For sure. And I mean, we haven't talked about it, but uh, of course the cannabis industry, uh, uh, yes. you know, the legalization <laughs> and how you know, Niagara College has done a great job of really legitimizing the industry and providing training and, and certificates and, you know, making it a profession in its own right when it might have, you know, some stereotypes associated with who would work in that industry. But it is very, you know, technical. There's a lot of science. There's a lot of, you know, agronomy that goes on to make, to make plants grow. And it's no different in that industry. So certainly exploring the opportunities both indoor and outdoor agriculture and, and a lot of automation as well, which requires mm -hmm. maybe the machine itself is doing the harvesting or the treatments, but, but we need someone to program the machine or to repair the machine or to analyze the data that comes out. So again, a lot of different skills that are going on other than just picking, you know, the fruit or vegetable off of the plant or the tree that will be more and more important as we move forward and, and you know, digitize and have more technology in, in the food sector. I actually want to cycle the conversation back to you because I've just, again, I've been thinking about the current in that. And one of the things that you had mentioned is policies. And I know it might be a silly question, but I just wanted to better understand what a policy is and how does it even start to get going, I guess. Yeah, no, it's a great question. So that typically happens as initiated at the government level. Um, and so, well, I guess it works both ways. So whether the government has decided, you know, we need this in place either to protect something or to promote something or to, you know, stimulate something. So whether it's so broad to talk about okay. policies, but they're, they're in place for a reason, but then they're also so there are acts and, and legislation that's in place to, you know, say protect water or to enable farms to have what's called normal farm practices, things like that. So every once in a while, the government will review those things and maybe change them or propose changes to them. And that's kind of where our team can pro provide input, good or bad, to say, how is this going to impact agriculture? And that's kind of where I say our team is a team of eight because, you know, we have people on our staff that cover, you know, water issues or property assessment and taxation or labor or climate change or uh, energy. And so all those policies that the government is proposing, we can provide input into and say, how is this going to affect farmers and agriculture and try to uh, assist them in developing those policies so that they do what they're meant to do from a regulatory perspective, but they also don't provide too much red tape or restriction so that it causes farms to have challenges, you know, with profitability or sustainability. 
Wow. Honestly, that's really fascinating because it, it sounds, it's such a big scale agriculture. Like it's, it's not like you're dealing with just one farm where you can track the amount of crops that are grown this year to the next. Like it's, it's a huge amount of people and data and all those types of things involves. And I'm wondering, how do you even start to measure if something like, for example, the initiative with Feeding Your Future, how do you even begin to know if it's making an impact? Do, do you use any tools? Yeah, it's a great question. So as I mentioned, we're funded by the provincial and federal governments through the Canadian Agricultural Partnership. So this is a large funding envelope that has all kinds of different streams from economic development to environmental stewardship to protection and assurance, which is more kind of like traceability and food safety. And so under those buckets, there's the various streams. So as I said, ours was to address labor challenges and training opportunities. So we do have some deliverables that are expected of us and some reporting that is required of us back. So a lot of that information can be collected through, you know, surveys and interviews. And the great thing about this project is it is quite tangible. You know, you can see how many people attended mm. an event and uh, how many connections were made and how many jobs are posted through the concierge service and how many people came onto the webinar and then certainly asking afterwards um, through surveys, you know, how people's experience and right. getting that sense of if it's helping. And then I also haven't mentioned yet, but we have quite a bit of uh, social media presence. So we have Twitter, Facebook, uh, Instagram, and LinkedIn accounts. And that has been a great way to engage both with, you know, agri-food employers, but also with the general public and, you know, seeing retweets and, and likes and, and responses mm -hmm. and direct messages. So you know that you're getting that traction. And really, like I said, the awareness of the agri-food sector, I mean, it's something we've always had a challenge with about um, recruiting people outside of, I grew up on a farm. Um, oh, okay. And so, like, if you're from the industry, if your parents farmed or your grandparents farmed, you know, you have that connection to agriculture. And, and so it's a lot more likely you'll end up in the field. But I think a lot of people are hesitant to uh, explore a field that they don't know anything about. And, you know, only 1.8% of um, Ontarians are, are working on farms. <laughs> so um, you think that's 98% that don't have a connection to, to farming anymore when it used to be, you know, 50%. Right. So um, how do we promote uh, what's available and awareness and buck stereotypes while, you know, continuing to do it. So it's a slow process for that mm -hmm. one. It's a lot harder to measure, but there's a lot of great organizations beyond OFA and beyond this initiative that are also working hard, like Farm and Food Care and Agscape are two great organizations that are trying to bridge that public awareness gap and also educate the next generation. Well, I'm happy that you can share those names as well on here because, and I'll make sure to link all the social media platforms that you had in, in the show notes for this episode. But I mean, personally for me, I, I don't know how I kind of figured out about food. I think it was the food network, to be honest, that was my kind of gateway because <laughs> I'm from a suburban area. I, I mean, I live close to Milton, which does have a lot of farms, but to think like, I don't have any people that really were in that agricultural side. So I do focus on the food processing, but I think it's great to have more awareness because I know with my program, for example, no one ever talks about this, even though I'm in the sciences, which is really strange to mm -hmm. me. Like we talk about, you know, maybe like looking at environmental impacts and such, but not like having a full-time role. So it's, it's great to hear that there's more initiatives. Yeah. And even, you know, with science, things like nutrition, right? Or nutrient management, or there's so many aspects of the food sector that require a strong science background as well, and specific to agriculture. It is very scientific, actually, about how to grow yeah. a plant or an animal successfully. And I'm still in awe of the people that have that background and that understanding of weed science and fertilizers and how to optimize growth and those things that you know, from an economic development right. perspective, I don't necessarily think specifically about the science behind it, but I think there, there's a lot of great opportunities there if you're willing to explore the sector. And I also don't have a farming background and 
growing up in Niagara, yeah, the same. I had friends that were, were from the sector, but I honestly just kind of fell into it. And it seems to be those who don't have an ag background kind of do fall into it. <laughs> so I'm hoping that, yeah, through this program, we're doing a lot of um, profiling as well of individuals that have interesting jobs in agriculture. And a lot of times didn't come from a farm background to try to uh, showcase that there are ways to get into it without. And so just take a chance, right? Give it a try and you'd be surprised how rewarding it can be, especially even if you just, you know, like cooking or you like, mm -hmm. uh, you know, going to the farmer's market. It's very rewarding, I think, to work in, in the food sector and be part of that. I, I agree. I, I got to shuffle your information over to the biology students in my program. I, I feel like a lot of them again, like I've been in this program and when I was doing all the Ryerson career fairs, when I was um, early in my undergraduate degree, there was nothing. I'm very honest. There was, there was very much nothing that I could go to, to find out more about like food and agriculture. So I'm happy to hear that even like, again, with these virtual career fairs, although not the ideal, at least now there's like a gateway for someone to to start to have these conversations because career fairs were one of my favorite things in undergraduate to like learn more about another field that I had no idea about. So. Yeah. And I find that at least for my career path, I, it was a lot easier to find out what I didn't want to do than to really find out where I did. And so you kind of, I, I mean, my advice to those who are in that early early days with their career is, is, you know, it doesn't hurt to try and, and you don't have to have a completely linear path of knowing exactly where you'll end up, but it's always great. I mean, I find with my science undergrad, I have, you know, I use those right. analytical <laughs> skills every day in my job by being able to analyze policies and, you know, have that skill set. And so even though, yeah, I'm not working in that field exactly, uh, it's a skill I've carried with me. And, you know, drama and musical theater, you wouldn't think, but uh, public speaking and, and that comfort, you know, to go to conventions and conferences and be able to speak, you know, having that skill set. So I think really you should look at yourself as, as what do I have to offer? What are the skills that I've developed through, through my background and how can I apply that? Because you'll be surprised at um, how transferable a lot of those skills are. Do you have any advice, um, this actually really folds well to one of my questions, because do you have any advice when it comes to, it seems like the farming industry is moving, well, I say farming, but the whole agricultural industry is, is moving at a really strong pace. And sometimes I don't think that people realize that they have skills that could be transferable to other fields with young people, with these skills that are transferable. What advice would you give for them to be able to package what they have and kind of highlight it that it can become transferable. Yeah, I think, um, you know, from an agri-food employer perspective, they're looking for, as I said, kind of more of that work ethic and reliability. And I, we've heard about it in a few other sectors as well, but I think, you know, that willingness to show up every day and try and give it your all and, and willingness to learn. And so uh, anyway, you can showcase that in your resume. Um, will provide that background. So even if you think uh, some volunteer position you had or something else doesn't seem relevant, it does show you're taking initiative. It shows that you're willing to commit to something. And so, yeah, I think just don't be shy to put your name out there. And I would say a huge thing is, is get to know the sector or the business themselves and try to tailor to show that you did your research and that you genuinely do have an interest. I know it's hard when you're job seeking, you're kind of mm -hmm. just throwing all the resumes and seeing what sticks. So it is hard to do that, but it goes a long way as someone who's helped in the recruiting process to just see that someone has taken the effort to understand what is OFA? What do we do? Um, and as soon as they can say that back to you, it's very impressive that they oh, okay. put in the time instead of just seeing, oh, it's a this role, I think I could do that role. It's why OFA though? Why, why my organization? And so I think that's the same with, with other businesses. If you, can, if you can show why specifically their business spoke to you and, and that you've done a little bit of research, that goes over and above, I think, just the skills that you put on your resume is that you're really demonstrating that skill of um, work ethic and willingness to uh, 
put yourself out there. Are there any associations or networking circles or any of these types of things that relate to the agricultural sector that a student could maybe join? Hmm, that's a good question. Certainly, or your uh, what you're doing with with food grads is great for, yeah. for food processing. And I couldn't speak to specifically, but there's 4-H, there's Junior Farmers of Ontario are two that come to mind that are kind of for the younger and in agriculture, we call under 40 younger. So, um, okay. <laughs> um, you know, to get more engaged and I hear 4-H, I've, I've never done 4-H myself, but I hear 4-H has been a great bridge uh, especially if you're from an urban community to just learn more about agriculture and about food. And then the University of Guelph, of course, everyone sees sees that university as, as the agriculture and the food university. So there's lots of clubs and groups within that uh, if you did end up going to school there. Those are kind of the few off the top of my head. There's definitely a lot of organizations and local groups. So I would say, especially if you are based in in a more rural area, you could connect with some of the uh, local organizations because a lot of the national or provincial organizations have a local chapter, so you can kind of explore it that way. Okay, yeah, I, be I bet there's tons. I could imagine that honestly, with a quick Google search, you could probably write like Ontario agricultural uh, networking, probably there might be something there. So, <laughs> yeah, but. It's cool about, um, it's interesting that you mentioned 4-H. They're actually one of the ones I want to eventually get someone on the podcast on here because I think that's that's another thing I want to just learn more about because their name keeps popping up, so. Yeah, yeah, and, and I, I hear I hear it as well all the time how it's really developed people um, and and assisted them with their journey and, and if they are from an urban background and to especially if they're in, you know, livestock and they're, you know, dealing with a cow or something like that. It's a completely different experience than uh, they're used to. So I think try new things, explore new things, put yourself out there, you know, volunteer at your local farmer's market, anything that you can kind of see as a way to showcase your interest in, in agriculture and food. And even if it doesn't lead to a career, whether you want it to or not, it's always good to know more about where your food comes from and better understand the food system. So that's good for your health and, and uh, you know, your well-being anyway. So it's, there's not really a, a downside <laughs> to for giving sure, that a yeah. try. For sure. And you never know when it'll pop up and maybe be relevant to your, because sometimes like another thing that I've heard is that things that you might not think are relevant to your resume are actually, I remember I had applied to a company that, makes french fries and they said oh have you not worked in any fast food places and i said well yes i did and they're like well why didn't you put it on the resume and i was like well i didn't really think it was relevant to this type of job and they said it's really relevant because that's where our product goes and we want to know that hmm. you have been involved with our product so i thought it was funny yeah exactly and uh, I think that this is a good point to also ask you about, we've been kind of talking about it, but I wanted to know if you could give any advice to students or young people thinking about pursuing a career in agriculture, food, beverage, these types of industries, what advice would you give them? I would say, think about what your interests are and how that might apply to this career. Um, we haven't even talked about craft beer, craft cider, you know, that whole industry, tourism, right? There's a lot of really neat jobs and interesting ways that you might not think of as agriculture, but they're, they're definitely connected. And like I said, if you have a passion for say cooking or shopping local, that's already something that I think can be easily applied to an, an industry like this. The other piece is probably reiteration of of the background and the skill set. We are looking for people in all sectors, from all backgrounds, from all educational, uh, you know, attainment. We, we really do need people in everything. So if you have an interest in agriculture or food, there is likely a job already out there <laughs> waiting for you. And I guess the other piece is, is to speak personally about my background and how you know, I applied for a job that wasn't a perfect fit for me, 
because I was interested in food and I kind of just went for it and that job was not the right one for me, but they went back and created a position that was literally made for me. So it's really, you have no idea. They said, you know, we've always been thinking about economic development, but we've never really the resources behind it. And then you just appeared and had that (laughs) background and it was a great opportunity. So I think don't underestimate, you know, your, what you bring to the table, because if you are a good candidate, even if you're not a perfect fit for a certain position, those who see your value will may find a way to to have you or they'll keep your resume on file and call you up when something does come available. And the other piece is don't underestimate the power of relationships, which I haven't talked about yet, but our, my first job from my master's was from a professor's connection. And my second job, which is now OFA, of course, was my master's research project. We had an Ontario Ministry of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs, uh, analyst who was a part of that project uh, through the funding program. And she ended up being my reference for my OFA application. So mm-hmm. you meet these people through your schooling and you don't necessarily think of them as gateways into your career. But I think uh, thinking of them as people, as professionals that could actually help you in your career search and building those relationships, you know, not showing up for school in your pajamas and (laughs) sleeping through the lectures and, you know, putting yourself out there as a professional, as someone who is very serious, and then identifying people who maybe have connections you haven't thought of to help you find your first or, or next career opportunity. I like that. And I like that's another perspective is almost thinking as your student school as your professional career. It's just it is still very much, it's the gateway to your next steps. And this is why you're doing it for your career going to school. So you might as well just give it your all and show that you care to other people. It goes a long way. Yeah. And even with my undergrad, so I took a four-year break between my undergrad and my master's to figure out what I want to do when I realized it wasn't neuroscience and um, went, did some traveling, lived in New Zealand for a while did some volunteering and like I said, worked in restaurants and I was not really sure what I wanted to do next. And when this, and actually my friend who, who was in undergrad at the same time as me, she told me she was applying to this master's program. And I said, we've been out of school a few years. Who are you even going to use as a reference? I don't even know who would know if they'd even remember me. And I messaged the professor that I worked with you know, four or five years earlier. And he said, yeah, I was wondering where you ended up. And of course I'll write a letter of recommendation and everything else. You kind of underestimate, um, you know, what's possible. And so keeping, you know, making that impression on him that he, he still remembered me and was so willing to vouch for me, I think is really important. So not just seeing it as your grades and, and getting the degree, mm-hmm. but actually thinking about it as a networking opportunity in itself before you even get out into the career world. Thank you so much for even just mentioning that because that's a fear of mine is always when I'm thinking when it comes to that last line where it says references and I'm like I haven't talked to this person in two years who am I to like I don't even think they'd remember me even though it sounds absurd when they probably hung out with me for like two three years and I'm like why would they write me a reference letter like so Yeah. And I think we have that, you know, that self-doubt or that um, lack of confidence, especially early in our careers, that we don't really see it from their perspective as a professor or whoever that that's kind of their gig. They know that (laughs) students are looking for their support in order order to make those career moves. And generally speaking, if you were a good student and a reliable student, um, they'd happily support you in your career path. So it doesn't hurt to ask, right? The last, the, the, the worst thing they can say is no, or, or, you know, dodge your email, (laughs) but at the end of the day, having, it's way better to put yourself out there because honestly, like I said, when I applied to this master's program, I didn't know what economic development was either. It seemed like business and environment. And I had this weird neuroscience degree and they took kind of backgrounds from all disciplines. And so I said, okay, as long as I apply and get in somewhere, then I can always transfer into another program once I figure out what the heck this thing is. And going into it, I 
had no idea what it was and it, the learning curve was very steep but then i just fell in love with it so it's quite interesting how how it all comes together even though it's very much not a linear or logical pathway but just I keep trying <laughs> yeah work no, out. for sure i love that and it, and it's it really brings home the message of this whole initiative and feeding your future and just the agriculture and the food industry in general that they're looking for people from all walks of life they don't expect every single person to have been in a lineage line of people who have have been farmers for their whole lives or their families been working in the farm they want all disciplines because it gives these new perspectives to things that really that's what the industry needs to continue to grow and, and be strong and be still be a strong force in ontario exactly we need that diversity we need fresh blood fresh perspectives new ideas and skill sets that you don't just get from growing up on a farm you do genuinely have to get them elsewhere. And so that's where we'd love to loop more people in and have that conversation of how can we help you find your dream career in agriculture. Awesome. I think that is a great place to end the show. But I had two questions because I just want to really drive home for if students want to get involved with feeding your future or find out more or, you know, go through it, what can a student do? Yeah, so we have a, a website, feedingyourfuture.ca, and as I said, you know, for social media channels as well. So that's a great place to connect. We have an email address uh, as well, feedingyourfuture. Uh, sorry, feedingyourfuture at ofa.on.ca. So you can email us directly. Uh, I'm on Twitter as well, personally at Let's Grow Food, and happy to connect with you there or on LinkedIn. And really, just hopefully you can find something some way to connect with us and, and learn more about what the project is and if you have any additional questions we'd be happy to help you that's great i'm so happy i got to share that so everyone go check them out if i'm assuming if you're listening to this podcast as many of you are very interested in coming into these careers so this would be a great starting point to maybe even see what you could match and find so thank you danielle for coming on the show i really enjoyed this hour it flew by thank you so much it's great to be here That was episode 20 of the Food Grads podcast. All the notes to this podcast can be found on the Food Grads website by clicking the podcast tab on the homepage. There you can find any notes to past or future episodes. If you enjoyed this episode, then consider leaving a review on wherever you get the podcast. There's so many out there and we would really appreciate it. Overall, I was especially excited to share this week's episode because of the awesome collaboration Food Grads is doing with the OFA with the Feeding Your Future campaign. Feed Your Future is presenting even more virtual career fairs that you can attend to connect with employers in this industry throughout the year. This campaign is really going to shine even more light on how awesome this industry is, and no matter where you are, there's a career waiting for you in the agri-food industry. Anyways, that's it for this week's episode. Thank you everyone so much for listening. I'll see you next week.